Next, I'd like to welcome Heather Roberge. Uh, Heather founded uh, Heather Roberge Murmur in 2008, and Heather is an associate professor in the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA, where she currently holds the position of director of the undergraduate program in architectural studies. Heather's work explores the intersection of computation and material production to transform architectural spaces, assemblies, and projects, and objects. Combinations of digital information and material not only transform design production and its physical realizations in Heather's, Heather's work, but one might also say that in her work, the ultimate goal of the digital is to transform the analog in the way that space is engaged intellectually and sensorially. This transformation may be measured in terms of time, scale, structure, and program. Uh, these range from objects to installations to buildings such as uh, the Vortex House and to larger projects such as the New Taipei City Art Museum. It is the interplay between the digital and the analog in the work that once again unsettles a reductivist reading of process and production, and in this case, results in uneasy complexities. Please join me in welcoming Heather Roberge. Thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity um, to speak tonight. So I'm going to start first with a uh, gen general introduction of my design process by introducing a few thoughts on media. So a medium, in this case paint, is the material or technical means of artistic expression. It is the substance and the means of transmission of a force or effect. Painters use a medium to deliver pigments and reflect light in infinitely variable ways. The art historian James Elkins in What Painting Is describes the colors on the palette as empty without form or void. They are pure potential waiting for the movements and light that will dis disperse them across the canvas. Specifically tailored to the effects desired, paint's distribution rarely presents its intrinsic materiality. In fact, it has no single original state. Rather, painters transform paint's visual reception into illusions evoking qualities associated with other substances, may they be water, wind, or stone. As I'm limited to discussing just a few projects tonight, I'll use several smaller projects to illustrate an introduction to my work without discussing them in detail. My design process treats the elements of architecture, its form, structure, and space as different entangled media. These elements are initially unformed, but are quickly imbued with the geometric material and conceptual potential. As information-rich, inextricable mixtures, these elements produce singular effects, irreducible to any given material or technique of production. Just as one cannot reverse the production of a painting, my projects are synthetic composites of ideas and substances. As architectural inquiries, my work attempts to extend disciplinary knowledge. Its references are historical, theoretical, and technical, relating to work that precedes it and with the ambition to inform work that follows it. As substances, the work affects the eye, the mind, and the body. My work combines digital information and material, informing projects at scales from objects to gallery installations to realize buildings. Combinations of digital description and material inform the design process, its physical translation, and its effects. From drawings to models to full-scale fabrication, Digital tools yield precise geometric control of my work, coaxing material into new states. My design techniques draw insight from a broad array of material traditions from architecture and other fields, including garment making, metalworking, ceramics, and others. 
This allows me to apply extra disciplinary knowledge of material behavior, geometry and construction to distinctly architectural problems. The information in turn challenges the conventions of architectural assembly, opening up new avenues of production and with these new distributions of material in space. My built projects explore supple volumes informed by site conditions, program, and spatial ambitions. These projects often deploy unconventional structural solutions and bespoke details to articulate their respective concepts across scales. So the first project that I'll be speaking about in detail is the Vortex House. Uh, this project is sited on a hillside um, overlooking the Pacific Ocean. It's about a thousand feet above the Pacific Coast Highway and surrounded by, um, by the Santa Monica Mountains and an amazing panoramic view of the ocean. So the project's ambition lies in its dramatic spatial modulation and the saturation of its interior with the visual and geometric material of the surrounding site. Rather than understand the views as a way to release the interior to the exterior, the surrounding geometric and topographic features are drawn into the interior to condition its atmosphere. Artificial and natural geometries are characterized as of the same fluid medium and the house is a vortex into which this material is drawn. This ambition informs each part of the house's organization. Its five-sided sculpted form, its folded roofscape, its exterior wrapper and covered patio. The house occupies a site in the rugged bluffs of Malibu overlooking the Pacific. Its hillside location presents stunning views in all directions. Its ex exterior wrapper is thus intentionally lengthened by its five-sided building form and the introduction of a south-facing patio. This wrapper in the project's Form, maximize the visual exposure of the interior to the distant mountain and ocean views, providing at least two large apertures to draw in the site's natural geometries. Its folded roofscape rises and falls dynamically, modulating the living spaces beneath it. In fact, this series at the bottom of this slide shows the initial um, spatial diagrams of the project. The roof's perimeter is typically low, while its center is high, opening to a courtyard above. This locates the ceiling of every room in the foreground of the unfolding landscape that surrounds the house. The house is constructed of two structural systems nested within one another. A steel frame draws the spatial modulation of the interior and stiffens the folded roof plane. Conventional timber framing infills the steel frame to stiffen its walls. The spatial ambition of the house is impossible without the use of structural hybridity. Force follows material, so uncommon distributions of material require structural ingenuity. In this case, two systems are intertwined, allowing force to flow back and forth between them. Natural cooling is achieved throughout using several strategies. Apertures are placed to take advantage of prevailing winds. The courtyard is a literal vortex of circulation, drawing hot air in and out its top. The patio cover shades south-facing windows. So I'll walk you through the project. At the top of the screen is the north-facing facade and entry to the house. The roof slips beyond the perimeter walls of the house and, um, and ends in, an, in a glass aperture or door that allows you to enter. 
Um, when you enter, you see the roof plane as ceiling above. And toward the west, you have a view of the Malibu Pier. And in the distance, you see the ocean, which begins to rise into the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, in this view, you see the way in which the courtyard of the house allows views to bifurcate in the interior of the house. So the house, in fact, a quite small house of 1,300 square feet, unfolds cinematically as you move. This is a panorama shot showing on the left the ridge line of the Santa Monica Mountains and to the right the Pacific Ocean. And if we move toward the vertical space on the left side of the screen around the courtyard, we circulate to the more private areas of the house which you can see on the right side of this slide. And so as you come around, the space of the house has, has reoriented to the vertical. And in the corridor, you can move to a den to the left or into the master bedroom straight ahead. To the right is the court and a master bath. So here's the courtyard at the center of the building. The master bath allows a view to cut through the courtyard and back into the living space to the ridge lines beyond. If we go into the den, we have a view of the ridge line to the north and the shape of the window apertures are drawn to rhythmically coalesce with the features of the landscape. So you can see the window sill folds down from uh, sill height to the floor, incorporating large doors into the openings. And then from the den, you can view across the courtyard again to the ridge lines to the west, back to the corridor and into the master bedroom. And the master bedroom um, has a series of doors that open to the south facing patio and that allows you to circumnavigate the house around the center of the courtyard in an exterior covered space. And then back into the living and kitchen area. So the next project I'll show is in addition um, to a residence in Beverly Hill, Hills. So this was commissioned by a screenwriter and his family um, as an addition to their sprawling mid-century ranch. And the addition contains a writing studio, guest bedroom, and a garage for a classic car collection. It's inspired by the iconic butterfly roof and the project features a hovering volume uh, that's topped with four roof planes that slope in opposite directions. The roof modulates programmatic volumes below and responds to uh, strict height restrictions and site relationships. A figural cut on the face of the upper story to uh, the north or up on the screen uh, reveals two volumes that compress in plan to draw exterior space into the addition and to reduce the scale of the project from the ad adjacent street and yard. Along its second level exterior walkway, a diaphanous guardrail fabricated of two sheets of aluminum produces more effects. So, um, to enter from the garage to the upper level of the addition, there's a stair that drops you off in this exterior balcony. And this balcony overlooks the existing home's loggias and pool. And the guardrail you can see here to the left, the two spaces, the writer's studio and the guest room share a, an involuted balcony um, that looks out across this 
guardrail into the um, distant landscape. So the, um, all of the walls of the house are folded into a figure eight, and these surfaces basically pull both bodies and views along the interior programmatic volumes and out into the landscape. And the guardrail is the kind of structural experiment in this project. Um, rather than frame every panel of the guardrail with its own frame. We, are, we fold two sheets of aluminum so that they're tangent to one another and the two surfaces gain rigidity and are subdivided much less frequent, frequently because of their um, structural interaction with one another. And the load of the guardrail is taken by the top rail, so everything below it is a kind of lighter gauge um, uh, kind of series of sheets. And these are some of the drawings of those folded conditions. And the double skin of the guardrail then sleeves a series of vertical uprights that limit the span of the top of the guardrail. And so um, it appears to kind of defy um, structural logic how this surface um, is, is made rigid. So the next project is, um, is an ideas project. It's really a speculative project. It was also, um, uh, commissioned by the editors of 306090 for volume 13. It was a book entitled Making a Case. We were asked to address a contemporary crisis in American housing, and the succulent house was our response. So the contemporary American house is experiencing a deepening crisis of identity in this era of growing environmentalism. This identity crisis began nearly 50 years ago with the end of the case study house program and the rapid acceleration of suburbanization. The discipline of architecture never regained its footing in the context of American housing as housing became a product subject to the efficiencies and economics of mass manufacture. The impact of suburban sprawl on energy, water, and transportation infrastructure was largely overlooked until its geographic consequences were firmly entrenched. The widespread growth of environmentalism has done little to assert a new identity for the American house. Whether produced individually or en masse, the American house remains a mixture of old forms, updated equipment, and engineered building products that mimic long abandoned methods of construction and long uh, discarded lifestyles. So an appreciable shift has been underway for a number of years now as a new audience of environmentally concerned citizens gathers. While thus far this audience has embraced environmentally friendly product and equipment upgrades, this approach is insufficient as its impact on sustainable development is minor and its rate of change too slow. We believe growing environmentalism should be met with design ingenuity, not product specification. Our proposal, The Succulent House, addresses the pressing global issue of freshwater quality and supply as but one force to, do, to drive design ingenuity and improve environmental performance. Ultimately, this approach allows us to speculate on the organizational, spatial, and atmospheric potential of water collection on the American house. The succulent house is sited on a prototypical urban parcel in Chicago. Measuring 50 feet by 110 feet, its site anticipates continuing trends toward inner beltway reurbanization. Organizationally, the roof area of the house is divided in two and its area maximized for water collection. 
storage, and distribution. The inverted roof planes direct rainwater to storage cores around which program is distributed. In the front of the house, which is down on the slide, storage bladders cascade from the modulated ceiling above to line the more public living spaces. In the rear or top of the slide, the kitchen and master suite surround a bladder-wrapped winter garden. Our proposal argues that performance is not measured by quantitative methods alone. In fact, we draw on rainwater harvesting in large part because of its impact on the spaces we propose. Roofscape collection is experienced from the interior as the space of the roof rises and falls to meet the um, living space. The collected water is stored in bladders that respond to changes in seasonal rainfall. Like its namesake plant, the bladders exhibit succulents in times of increased water supply. In times of low supply, the bladders are loose and drapery-like. As the bladders fill, the reflective surfaces capture views of adjacent conditions in unexpected ways, optically collapsing adjacent spaces into one another. The succulent house alters the form and atmosphere of the house by integrating rainwater cycles into the rhythms of everyday domestic life. The next project is an installation completed last summer called On Point. Um, this project was displayed in the gallery at SciArc in Los Angeles. On Point is an array of architectural objects reflecting on the historical and spatial significance of the column as both object and series. Inspired by the hypostyle hall, On Point is a group of columns poised on blade-like fulcrums, defining dynamic spaces below. To achieve a balanced state, the mass and silhouette of each column is eccentrically distributed to stabilize its adjacent columns. While unstable individually, the columns enter a state of poise when grouped. On Point challenges qualities long associated with structural and visual stability, proposing alternative distributions of force and material, and with these, reconfigured spatial experiences. Um, so this is a bit of a break in the, in the rhythm of the presentation, but um, I wanted to detail um, briefly the various forms of technology that come to bear on this project. Um, as, uh, because that reveals my kind of uh, agnostic take on technology. So um, the analog, as Mario mentioned, are represented on the left. The uh, mallet, which was used to force the unruly break formed material into the place we needed it to be. Rivets and uh, sheets of aluminum are basically the input material for the project. While the project uh, required a design process that afforded feedback between the analog and digital recurrently throughout the process. So using Unity, which is an open source game engine, we did a series of simulations um, that I'll show with a very low tech video. Um, which were assessing the stability of the collection of objects we arrayed. So you can see version nine worked. And then um, as we defined the gauge of the aluminum and our connection details and our approach to assembly and erection, we used a series of SAP 2000 models in order to assess the behavior of the material under the loads um, that, that, flow, that were to flow from object to object. Um, most important to us, really, was both the structural experiment and a related spatial experience. So the project is regulated with uh, three datums of geometry a series of uh, pentagons at the top 
rec uh, narrow two inch rectangles at the base and triangles at the waist, which form an interstitial space that allows you to circumnavigate the columns and to inhabit the interior of the array. So this section shows the definition of the space under the objects that are tangent and kiss one another at their tops. The SciArt Gallery has uh, a unique condition that allows you to view all the installations from a mezzanine level above. So the project was also meant to uh, be perceived as in a more figural or object uh, manner from the top and a more spatial manner from below. Uh, this is a series of uh, unfolded patterns or developed patterns that were necessary for producing the columns. So each of these is laser cut and CNC break formed in order to, with um, a high degree of accuracy, take on the anticipated forms. This is a laser cut model that describes that process. So the column has long been a site of architectural study and ingenuity. It is at once symbolic and functional. Its verticality marks the distance between horizontal planes. And as it is repeated and positioned, it determines spatial order. Its status as an object is marked by geometric variations in silhouette, massing, and termination, coalescing into a particular figural presence or formal order. On Point reflects on the column to challenge its conventions. It inverts the column's relationship to the ground, intensifying its spatial effects. Its Tapered silhouette challenges long -held, the long-held notion of fermitas, originating with Vitru Vitruvius as a necessary expressive quality of the column. Instead of visually stabilizing each column with a sturdy and broad base, on point develops visual stability through interdependence. Individual columns enter a stable state through the adjacency and specificity of its neighbors. Materially, the exhibition extends the potential of planar elements in the construction of the column. On point is sculpted of metal patterns that when folded produce both enclosure and structure without an internal frame. It thus invents a column type that combines the surface active structure of Felix Candela and the section active structure of Mies van der Rohe. Underlying the development of this exhibition was an active engagement with, the, with history as a deep reservoir of insight into the nature of the column. In the exhibit, we presented a partial historical survey of the column, mapping its role in the production of space. This genealogy speculated on the relationship of column form to its distribution in space over time. On Point draws on these insights to cross-pollinate historical cases with one another, producing the first of what we hope are numerous possible futures of the column. So the last project I'll show is the new Taipei City Museum of Art. This project uh, was an international competition that my office entered a few summers ago. Our proposal wears a loose cloak of color that sweeps lightly across the landscape, leaving elegant contours in its wake. Resembling large sails, the building's surfaces appear to flutter as lenticular color effects enliven its surfaces. Its masses are cloaked with, with a series of envelopes that we describe as, uh, as having sheet logics these surfaces are able to, um, to move free from the floor plates and volumes of a museum of art 
a research library, and a children's museum. And in so doing, they combine to, dis to define interstitial spaces between the various programmatic components and um, between the building and the surrounding landscape. So the building's figure remains elusive like a body concealed beneath a loose dress. This aloof elusiveness animates the project's changing silhouette and draws relationships between the project and the surrounding urban fabric. Despite its large scale, the museum experience is punctuated by unique and dramatic spaces that move from vast and horizontal to tall and sculptural. Our galleries are both separated and connected by interstitial voids that cascade through the interior and organize visitor circulation. While our cloak protects artwork from exposure to direct daylight, it also opens public amenity and lobby spaces to the exterior and defines outdoor spaces, including a central art plaza where visitors gather for events and exhibitions. And so you can see in this low-tech GIF the way the envelopes change as you move up. And in the center of this section, you'll see the way the uh, building envelopes join, um, requiring a kind of suspension structural system and allowing a series of public spaces to join between its separate masses. So our cloak draws the organizational and the cosmetic together through the use of sheet logics. The project surfaces, both its envelopes and suspended roof canopies, are clad in colorful ceramic extrusions, capitalizing on the local ceramics industry. Each extrusion is V-shaped with unequal edges. The smaller face is glazed in deep blue. The larger changes from vibrant yellow to rich purple, depending on its, um, on its location on the building. Here, color is selected in relation to solar exposure, spatial adjacency, and massing. The color deepens as spaces become more enclosed and immersive. Across the project, color is not assigned to individual faces, but is rather allowed to roll over corners and creases. This heightens the experience of the facade as vast flowing sheets. High contrast colors are selected for the outer faces of the building to captivate viewers from a distance, while subtle color variations are selected for the pedestrian spaces of the central art plaza. Thank you.